Hello and welcome to episode 9. In this video, I complete my customized Tau Storm Surge model kit. Some of you 40k fans will probably see right away where I kit bashed a Devilfish hull and some 3D printed pieces to set this model apart from what Games Workshop offers. The shoulders and wrist portions of the model were designed by Kaylin of Advanced Tau Tactica and are available from Blueprints on Shapeways, which I will link to below. I've base coated these parts in a custom mixed primer comprised of Steinile Res White, Grey, and some blue ink to represent an old GW color called Space Wolves Grey. The dark machine portions of the model were done with black primer with a zenithal highlight of Vallejo Model Air Base Grey and dry brushed with Citadel Administratum Grey layer paint. This is the aforementioned primer I mixed up, and I'll be going over the parts again to catch any recesses or thin spots I missed in my initial pass. I've talked about my modeling tools in previous videos, but it doesn't hurt to say it again that I don't buy and use top-of-the-line items. This airbrush was a very inexpensive model that came with a small battery-powered air supply. This just goes to show that you don't need to buy expensive tools and supplies to have a project come out great. I had these printed from Shapeways when the industry was still in its infancy. Now I can print at home with incredible resolution and detail. After going over the parts to make sure everything is cut up, I can move on to the next step of my project. I use this decanted and thinned Tamiya X2 white to give the model its zenithal style highlight. Again, I always test my airbrush on my gloved hand to make sure it's working properly before potentially finding out on the model. It might be tough to see, but I am adding thin layers of this glossy white to the uppermost areas where light would fall when the model is assembled and standing in its final pose. These alligator clips really make handling sub-assemblies a lot easier than if I didn't have them. This is a set I got off one of the big Eastern eBay style sites you could find online. One of my least favorite things about the original Storm Surge model was the way GW positioned the stubby missile pod arms. Thankfully, the aftermarket agreed, and there are a few alternatives available. I don't want too much of the pale blue-gray showing through on the finished model. The majority of it should read white, but on its own white can be boring. This is the result of mixing the red and yellow Steinal Res primers. I got this great Tau-esque orangey tan color, which I'll use to make the same style highlights as I did on the white surfaces. And, as you can see, it creates a subtle contrast right away, giving me a soft highlight on all the upper surfaces I choose to apply it to. Sorry for the focus here. In order to avoid the constant adjustments as I move items in and out of frame, I set my camera to one focus point to see if I could constrain my movements. But I had a hard time keeping my hands low enough to stay in focus while I was airbrushing. These models available to us now are such a fantastic leap from the original XV8 design from way back in 2003 when I started gaming.
And now that I have the highlight mostly done, it's time to mask. This is such a tedious step, but so worth it. I'll save you the agony of watching that slow process and skip ahead. I bought these various width masking tape rolls on that previously mentioned site. They're pretty inexpensive next to their name brand contemporaries. Having this many tools and supplies doesn't happen overnight. I've been hobbying in one way or another for around 35 years. Don't be discouraged as a beginner if you can't go out and buy everything I'm using. Take your time and start small. Before you know it, you'll have lots of supplies and skills to draw upon. Can you sense my dread? I was not looking forward to masking this piece. There are so many complex shapes to work around. And I ended up having to take a few breaks from this step, but in the end the effort and time spent is worth it, you'll have to trust me. Thank goodness that's done. While this is supposed to be a fun and relaxing hobby, some parts of it can be trying, but overall it's what you make of it. This is one of my favorite go-to paints for dark areas, Vallejo Model Air Base Gray. It looks a bit light in this shot where it's wet, but it dries a touch darker and gives me that medium to dark base color I'm after. It airbrushes and paintbrushes equally well. Back when I was a lot younger, I really only had access to testers paints which were alkyd based and a pain to clean up. I'm thankful for those when they were available, but nothing beats the ease of cleaning up acrylic paints with household solvents. I'll give the gray a wash now with this Army Painter Dark Tone Quickshade. I've diluted it a bit with alcohol, and this helps it dry quickly and flattens the gloss down a touch too. I'm not a big fan of glossy shades and washes. They tend to distort the way the paint will look when you have a final flat coat on the model. This can make it difficult to assess the intensity of the application. After a few coats of shade later, I can correct some of the overzealous application with some light airbrush highlighting. This is base gray again. In the recent past, I used to watch other creators' hobby content and be amazed at their skill and precision. I used to get sort of anxious and start to doubt my own abilities. I realized that I never wanted my viewers to feel that, and so I make sure to show you that I make mistakes pretty well all the time. I also show you how to correct them. Back to the project, I'm using Administratum Grey here to dry brush some subtle highlights onto the edges. I use this old makeup brush my wife donated to apply a soft edge, 
but not before removing a lot of excess paint first. You likely know how dry brushing works, so I'll save you listening to that lesson again. When it comes to highlighting with a dry brush, less is more. Stop when you think it's enough and take a step back to look at the work you've done. And now I can take a moment to see how everything looks together by dry fitting the parts. It looks fairly cohesive to me, and I'm happy with the amount of contrast I've achieved. And now I can do some relaxing brushwork on all the various fairings, rivets, domes, and sensors, etc. I'm using Vallejo Model Air Base Gray again, and as I mentioned before, it brushes very well. I have it thinned slightly, and even now it still has some great opacity. The smart missile system on the upper area of the rocket pod assembly gave me an opportunity to use some balance in my overall project. If you watched the previous video where I completed the base and legs for this model, You'll remember that I painted some crate scenery a bright orange. Carrying that color into the model will add some unity between the base and the figure, and balances the composition as well. I'm giving the smart missiles a base coat of Citadel Blood Red. The orange I used to paint the crates is fairly translucent, so I need to build some base layers first. The next coat will be Citadel Blazing Orange. I'll leave a little red showing towards the base of the missile where it meets the pod. This way, there will be a nice transition from the darker red color to the intense orange. I'm resting my hands on my desk, which helps to steady my brushwork. I think we all have a tendency to really tense our bodies when we're painting small details like this, and I try to be aware of my posture and relax a bit more when painting. I hope that comes across in my body language, as this hobby, among others, is how I find a way to take my mind off my day to day. You can see how the orange is brightening up the red undercoat and has a really nice contrast against that dark gray face of the missile pod. And for the final step, I'm using this very neon translucent orange that I also use for plasma effects on other models. I'm gently stippling some wet paint onto the tip of the missile and trying to make the edge of the circle I'm painting thinner. This way I'll get more of a blend between the three colors I used. Time to zenithal highlight the white armor portions of the model. This is decanted Tamiya X2 white again. I've thinned it from the original jar it came in and will add thin layers to my Space Wolves gray base coat to make some subtle shading and highlights. Now that I have tested the airbrush on my hand, I can begin positioning the part in a way that I think light would hit it when it's assembled. It 
It might be hard to see, but there is a fine difference between the highlight and the base coat. You've already had a preview of the finished model at the beginning of the video, so you can trust the result. Because I mix up larger batches of ready-to-use paints, I can always go back and repaint an area of base coat if I happen to make a mistake highlighting. I make quite a few mistakes every project, and I really want to make sure that you, the viewer, understand that fact. You should have just as much confidence creating a model like this that I have. Before I get back into highlighting, I want to talk about the pieces that went into this torso. The bulk of the structure is the rear half of the Devilfish APC, with the front carefully sawed off. I used part of the Storm Surge Kit torso to glue onto the bottom, so I'd have a nice mounting point to attach the pelvis and the legs. While the port side of the model has the regular Devilfish door, the starboard side has the shield generator bit covering that opening. The front plate is the top of a drone turret from Forge World. I'm using these stabilization thrusters from the Storm Surge Kit to fill in where the landing gear would normally go. I always appreciated when artists shared their ideas and processes, and I want to do the same for my viewers. I've been dreaming about this moment for a while. Seeing the highlight going on after so much modeling, gap filling, and planning is super satisfying. Again, I want the armor to read as mostly white. So I'm being pretty generous with my broad application of paint and letting the contours of the model help mask the shadow areas. By holding the model and directing your stream of paint, you can avoid painting shadowed areas like the bottom of the torso. The ability to control the airbrush makes for some smooth transitions. I coated the model pieces in this pledge floor coating. This product has been called Future in the past. <laughs> And, depending on what region you come from, it may be carried under a different name locally. Mr. Mark, Setter, and Softer help adhere and soften stubborn decals respectively. You'll see me use them to help decals conform to odd contours. I've got a small dish of warm water ready. If you haven't had much experience with water slide decals, they can be frustrating. I have been modeling for nearly four decades, and they still sometimes give me trouble. Don't be fooled by how smoothly this is going. I had to retake this scene more than a handful of times. But, like every problem big and small, perseverance is key. This is a great example of how quickly things can go wrong. Thankfully I have a lot of spare decals on hand, but if I didn't, I can see how this could get stressful. I'm making sure my alignment is where I want it to be before committing the decal to the surface with some Mr. Softer. This will melt the decal into the panel lines and help it look painted on. And after a somewhat challenging decal session, I can start focusing on adding a pinwash to the panel lines and joints of the pieces. On a light color combination like the Tau Tan and White, I'll stick to a lighter wash like this gray panel line accent color from Tamiya. I'll dilute this a bit with their X20 thinner, and that will allow me to control the intensity of the contrast a bit more than using straight liner. You can see how nicely and neatly it flows into the panel line. This is helped by the glossy pledge coating I applied earlier.
I generally start my liner application very neatly. Then, as fatigue sets in and I become less patient, I tend to get a touch sloppier with my work. Moving on from panel lining the entire model, I'll start to add weathering to the painted armor pieces. Normally, I prefer a clean looking model, but I think that the white benefits from the chipping I'm about to do. I'm using Steinel Res Ebony Flesh Colored Primer and some strips of a scuffing pad to add some organic and random chipping effects. I would have never thought to use a dark brown color like this for chipping until I saw Lincoln Wright's tutorial on weathering his Mac Mecca with a similar color. I'll leave a link to his video below in case you want to see some intense weathering. He truly is a master and has a few publications under his belt, as well as some pretty high profile clients. You can see here I'm using the scuffing pad strip to apply a somewhat random and organic chipping effect by gently dabbing on the ebony primer. It can be easy to overdo this step depending on your individual style, so start small and light, then take a step back and look at your work. You can rotate the direction you are applying chipping effects to prevent getting the same pattern showing up on your model. You can also have a few different applicators available for different effects. And now probably the most satisfying part, we're in the home stretch and starting to assemble the components we've painted so far. I use this JB Weld super glue to assemble my models now. I like the gel consistency and the ability it gives you to make adjustments before it dries hard. I'm test fitting the torso to make sure it will pose how I envisioned the final model. And I'm happy with how I think this is going to look. So now I feel good committing to gluing the torso down, and give that a few minutes to set. No big deal, a quick dot of super glue and the repair is made. I drilled a pair of holes on the shoulders to accept the ball joint style shoulder pieces and glued them on. Now I can position the elbow joint on the missile pod side of the arm. I'll use the super glue bottle to prop up the arm while the glue sets. It's the perfect height.
And finally, the head can go on the complete model. I couldn't help but laugh at my big clumsy fingers here. I hope you can too. And there we have it. Now it's time to fire up the turntable. I hope you enjoyed seeing this project come together. If you watched this far, maybe you'll consider subscribing to the channel for more projects like this in the future. I'll be covering many more tabletop, RPG, and historical subjects, and usually I do a lot of 3D printing too. I also have a Patreon, which you can find a link to below if you wish to make a small donation to me. Is there anything you'd like to see me build? If so, please comment your opinions on my work and your ideas for future subjects. Thank you very much for watching.